It's not every day you get run over by a big truck and live to tell the tale. But that's the story that Shane Boyd, the human speed bump, is going to tell us right here on the Manlyhood Mancast. You can be a man of courage, of honor, of integrity. You can be the father, the husband, the leader that your family and your community needs. This is the Manlyhood Mancast. Here's your host, Josh Hatcher. Gentlemen, welcome to the Manlyhood Mancast. I'm your host, Josh Hatcher, and I am grateful that you guys have tuned in for what we're doing here. Listen, if you like Manlyhood, if you like what you're hearing here on our podcast, please leave us a rating, a review, share this with somebody. Let's get the word out about Manlyhood, and uh, let's see if we can help more men become better men. And you are a part of making that happen by telling people about this episode, telling people about our podcast. I, I look forward to hearing who you tell about it. And guys, uh, we've got something exciting going on right now. We've got our Valentine's Day contest where we've got some jewelry for women that we're giving away. Uh, This is a contest for men, ideally, but really, I mean, anybody can enter. But the goal of this contest is for you as a man to win it, to be able to give some gifts to your spouse for Valentine's Day. We've got some great earrings from Jawbone and Honey, and some more earrings, actually, from... These ones are made out of leather from Haven Designed. We've got two pair of those. And we are giving those away along with a gift card for uh, that you can use to get di- night, a night out, a date night for Valentine's Day. You can take your spouse out for dinner and give her these lovely gifts, which we're excited to be able to offer you. Um, and if you want to win it, you need to go to manlyhood.com slash contests, and you can enter to win there. And if you want to get extra chances to win it, Just send me some money. (laughs) There'll be some links there at that link I gave you, manlyhood.com slash contests. And you can, uh, every dollar that you send will be uh, another chance for you to win. So let's see if we can uh, give this away here pretty soon before Valentine's Day. And let's see if we can make some some wife very happy. (laughs) So guys, today's episode, we're going to be talking with Shane Boyd. He is a marketing expert. He is a a speaker, but his title that really caught my eye is the human speed bump. (laughs) And it's a little bit morbid, but he's going to tell you what happened. And he's got quite the story to tell. So without further ado, here's Shane Boyd. Shane, it is great to have you on the show today. I am really grateful to have the chance to have a conversation with you. Uh, I, I had to laugh when I got your letter um, and it referred to yourself as the human speed bump. So I'm kind of <laughs> looking forward to unpacking that in a little bit. <laughs> oh man. Yeah. Thank you. It's an honor being here, man. Thank you for your time. I appreciate you. Yeah. Awesome. So why don't you tell me a little bit about yourself and, and about the work that you do, if you could. Okay. About myself, simple enough. Um, pretty basic dude. Um, 44 years old at the time of this recording, uh, married, have two kids. One, my daughter is 25 years old, and my son just turned 18. I was in the Coast Guard, would re, get remarried, but Coast Guard, young, got married, stupid young. Um, common story with the military, especially when you're in a seagoing service. Had a great time. Coast Guard's awesome. Military is awesome. Love the military. Um, by the time I was married, I loved her, and she loved everybody. You know, I mean, I was gone a lot, so I... It's just how that worked out, man. Um, but no, I got got full custody of my daughter um, of all time, September uh, 11, 2001. And I was my got full custody of my daughter. Um, but no, remarried. And currently what I do now, I am a marketing and mindset coach for the local business owner. Um, kind of picture because I was one for almost 17, almost 18 years. I owned a home inspection company. So I was in the trenches as a small business, you know, solo entrepreneur or solo proprietor. So I know that field very well. So I began coaching and then teaching them. And that's what I do full time now as well. Awesome. Yeah, it's cool to be able to kind of take the things you've learned and then put them into practice. 
<laughs> it is. And that way you, you, you meet like-minded people and you just, you just gel. I mean, yeah, I coach and consult and speak, but I mean, I'm kind of talking to myself like five years ago, 10 years ago. You know, that's what's really cool. I work with people who are within, you know, five years of starting their business. Still kind of floundering, right? I was like, all right, I've been there. I know that. So, yeah, we have affinity there. So I just enjoy the board. Awesome. So you, you mentioned getting full custody of your daughter. We had a guest on um, in the last season that talked about um, what it's like to kind of advocate for fathers and, and, and through that process. What was that process like for you? I would be remiss if I didn't say that first and foremost, and I don't know who's listening. Maybe it's a testimony for some, I definitely, I don't know. But I never shared this story without mentioning. That battle was won before I ever walked into the courtroom. God was on my side from day one. By the time that whole deal went down, I was already a new life. I was a believer in Jesus. I already had friends in the church. I had all kinds of affidavits describing. I kind of laughed on him, how give a person I am kind of thing and my story with getting full custody of my daughter man isn't like some of my other friends struggles and I had another buddy of mine who went through the same thing his was more painful um a little more difficult but it's um still kind of similar it's kind of a man world and kind of a woman's court in that field not always but kind of is man I walked into it my ex-wife never showed up Hmm. she never showed up I can't fathom that it grinds my gears to this day. I'm kind of cringing thinking about it. She never showed up, ever. Didn't show up for the divorce hearing. Didn't show up for the custody. I had emergency custody initially. Then shortly thereafter, September 11th, 9-11, I um, got full custody. And the full custody read it in almost verbatim in my, in my paperwork. It said, visitation will be whatever the father sees fit. So, no, that battle was won before I walked in courtroom, partner. I mean, it was it was a slam dunk. And of, of all things, it was a female judge hmm. um, who I'll see. Him. Yeah, that doesn't happen often. Stuff, right? yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, so she was she wasn't happy. Not only was the world trace and I was literally crumbling as we were in the room together, but you can just tell she was this perturbed. Like, how could a mom not even show up? for this you know so for me the custody portion really man was simple because a battle was won before i ever got there yeah that is a a tremendous story that's not the experience of a lot of men and so yeah you're definitely blessed that god was on your side for that man yes (laughs) yes i am thank you so um uh, uh let's get to you know probably and i'm sure you're probably used to to this because it's one of the things in your, your pitch letter that gets sent out, but um, let's yeah. kind of get into the heart of uh, what's this human speed bump thing all about? What happened to you? <laughs> um, I'll share this story. Now I'll keep it a little bit more brief. I'm not sure how much time you have. For. This is something I normally share for like a 45 minute speech deal, but I can just get to the short and skinny of it. Um, I mean, I mentioned earlier that I'm, I'm a believer in God and Jesus. Now at the time that this took place, I was not. That's important because of the absolute tomfoolery ridiculousness I was doing that evening <laughs> is what led to this ridiculous accident. Um, and it was, and I'll, I'll give credit to my girlfriend as well, who's now my wife. She didn't want to go out that night. I'm the one that pressed the issue to go out. Uh, but here's the story. And I'll tell you what the vehicle was because it matters for the story. Um, the vehicle that we were all in was a 1993 Ford F-350 diesel dually four-wheel drive crew cabs so it had the full size four doors with a fifth wheel in the back. Most, most guys know what a fifth wheel is but if you don't that's a big trailer hitch that goes inside the bed of the pickup truck that usually a horse trailer would get hitched onto. Um, that's a fifth wheel. Um, so that was a vehicle essentially the largest non-commercial vehicle on the road. I mean, that's a big, heavy freaking vehicle, right? A buddy of mine was driving. He was driving his girlfriend's in the passenger seat. I'm in the back seat with my girlfriend. So I had no worries. At the time, I did have my daughter um, that didn't have custody of her yet. She was actually with me uh, for the summer. And, and 
and she ended up staying with me longer than that because my ex-wife didn't want her back. It's a different story. So I wasn't a believer then. I didn't have custody then, but I did have my daughter. I was staying at my brother's house, my older brother. So he had an apartment in an apartment complex. So I tell you all this to let you know, A, my daughter was okay. I mean, at that time, she was, you know, five, six years old. She was fine. She was with my brother, nothing unusual. And by the time I went out, she was already asleep. So she would have no idea I was even gone. So we go out that evening, typical evening, throw some darts, shoot some pool, throw back some beers, that kind of evening. You've all been there or seen it or know what that's about. Now, the part that where it got really just awkward and bad for me is a buddy of mine who I was the driver that, that night, um, he comes back with shots of tequila. Never really was a tequila kind of guy, but when the man walks up and hands you a shot, he's not going to be like, oh, I don't drink that. No, you take the shot, right? Um, I've been 22 years old, full of, you know, male bravado, I guess, and just 10 feet tall and bulletproof. Well, the tequila didn't work out well for me. I got stupid drunk off a few shots and several beers, whatever I had that evening. And as the story goes, because in most of this night, I don't recall, but I remember this portion. I remember almost getting a fight with somebody, but didn't know why. I can't remember why. I remember a confrontation. I'm arguing back and forth with somebody. And I was stupid drunk. I had no chance of ever even wrestling with somebody. It would be silly. Buddy of mine walked me away from the situation. We went somewhere else. Well, I don't remember going to somewhere else. They ended up finding me in the men's room, passed out on the stall. You know, I was basically hung over, praying to the porcelain god, as they would say back in the day. <laughs> And they helped me to the truck and we began to drive home. I wasn't driving, so I'm thinking, whatever, it's a weekend. I got tomorrow off, not worried about it. I just had no worries. It was just it was an ordinary day, man. It was nothing unusual about any of the stuff I just told you was stuff I did a hundred times prior to that, stuff I did overseas when I was in the military. I mean, it's stuff that normal young guys do, you know, when they have the opportunity to do it. So nothing, kind of like any tragedy that happens, that day is normal, you know? I mean, you don't wake up that day knowing something terrible is about to happen. Otherwise, you're probably in bed, right? Um, so as we're driving back that evening, uh, we're driving through our neighborhood where I live. Now, in that neighborhood, there were speed bumps in the road. And the speed bumps, obviously, if you've been in different neighborhoods that have speed bumps designed to keep people from speeding, to so not run over kids and crap in the neighborhood. So speed bumps, kind of in, in a lot of areas, so it wasn't uncommon to go over multiple speed bumps. And it's important to the story because here's what happened. As we were driving to where I lived, um, I rolled down the back window. Now the passenger side back window, not the back going to the bed, but the back leading outside of the truck. I rolled down the window. And as the truck is driving through the neighborhood, I begin to crawl out of the window. Nobody has an explanation why. Don't know why. Maybe I was reliving my glory days of high school on car surfing. I don't know, man. It was dumb. So I'm crawling out of the window. And as the story goes, they hit a speed bump and they stopped and realized I wasn't in the truck any longer. Well, in that stretch of the road, there were no speed bumps. I was the speed bump. But nobody knew it. Um, as I said, they hit a speed bump. We were all drinking that evening. We we're all in our early 20s. Nobody had any common sense or even any kind of sense with this at all. My buddy comes of the truck, walks back to where I was, helps me up, and walks me back to the truck. Apparently, he thought that I was fine because I was cursing him. Makes sense. He ran me over. I mean, what are you going to say? Right? He was, I, was, I guess I was mad. So he put me back in the truck, drove back to where I lived, you know, went to the condo, where, uh, my brother's condo where I was staying, Got my brother up because he's six years older than me. So he's a whopping 28 years old at the time. Now, in all of our logic, he was a grown-up on charge. I mean, he was the oldest one there, so let's go see him. And he comes out and looks me up and down and goes, just lay him on the floor and let Shane sleep it off. I've seen him look worse. Nobody knew. Nobody knew that the truck ran me over. Now, it wasn't until the next day I wasn't waking up. I wasn't moving. I mean, seven, eight o'clock comes around. I, I wasn't moving. Now, what my girlfriend did was my brother, in their wisdom, thought, let's call Shane's dad and have him look at him. I, I kind of chuckle still whenever I say that. 
my dad was a great carpenter. If you wanted a deck built, he's your guy. He was not a physician, okay? Right. <laughs> he's not that guy. So he comes over, looks me over, essentially looked at his youngest son on the floor dying and said, call an ambulance now. And that's when everybody realized something's really bad. Something's, something bad happened. Well, I went to the first hospital and they saw me and they said, we don't deal with head trauma. Went to the next hospital in town, not terrible far away, maybe another 10, 15 miles from that hospital where there's a larger regional medical center. And that's when they looked me over, gave me an x-ray and they came out and they talked to my, at that time, my parents were there, my girlfriend was there and kind of somber tone because my girlfriend relayed to my parents what happened. Now, imagine me being a parent, you're thinking, what the crap happened? What what happened to Shane? Why is he a mess? And all she knew was he fell out of the truck. Well, the doctors and nurses came by kind of somber and was saying, here's here's what's going on. The right side of his brain, there's an aneurysm. It's bleeding profusely. And the left side of his brain is swollen and bruised. There is no possible way he sustained this injury by just falling out of the vehicle. Somehow, some way, the tire, the axle, something ran over his head. Nobody knew it. I can't say that enough. I don't want anybody thinking that I hold a grudge some 20 plus years later. Uh, nobody knew. I was, it was all young, drunk, and a head injury. You just don't know. Um, but imagine taking your head in a vice and just squeezing it. You don't get an injury just by falling. So that's when they realized he was run over. The axle ran over him. The tire ran over him. You ran over his head somehow, some way. And we have to perform brain surgery right now. Otherwise, he's not going to make it. So that's why I talk about being a human speed bump. Because I literally was a human speed bump to basically the biggest non-commercial people on the road. Um, and I'll laugh about it. So I mentioned time frame. It was about midnight when it happened, about 8 o'clock when I went to the hospital. That's why I say I was rushed to the hospital, air quotes, you know, eight hours after the incident. So that, in a nutshell, short and skinny, that's what happened that evening. That's how I became a human speed bump, being hmm. silly. I can't imagine. <laughs> so they did brain surgery. Uh, obviously, you made it, you know. I mean, you're here. So what was right. what happened next? <laughs> Gotcha. It, yeah, I, I made it, but nobody knew at the time. Brain surgery, and all this was, this was the first weekend of December 1999. Um, so it was it was a while ago from now. But technology was still pretty awesome. But still, it's your brain. I mean, the doctors and surgeons they were like saying, "Look, we believe he's going to make it, but we don't know how he's going to be after." I mean, it's brain surgery, so they have to cut into your my skull and cut here or there to get rid of the pressure or whatnot. And, um, but I remember, you know, some things in your life you just remember vividly and you can even remember smells. Smell is the most powerful um, memory sensory we have anyways, is, is why Disney World has popcorn when you first walk in. <laughs> so they can get you smell like that. Um, but no, so I remember everything about this morning that I woke up in the hospital. The surgery happened, they had me in a coma Basically, I was there about four, maybe five days. You know, they did the surgery, kept me in an induced coma to keep me asleep and healing. And I remember the doctor, the surgeon, waking me up. And I remember waking up. And he, I remember hearing him clap his hands a couple of times. You know, clap his hands. You know, call my name Shane. You know, clap his hands. Shane, you know, clap his hands. And I woke up and kind of came to and looked around and knew then that something was bad. Um, and they helped me kind of sit up and... My head's all bandaged. And I didn't really know that, but my first words were, um, my head hurts, you know? And my mom was like, you know how moms are asleep. My mom was all, honey, you were in a very bad accident. And I'm like, well, okay, what happened? And then I said, where's Aspen? I miss her. Aspen's my daughter. So my first real you know, coherent words afterwards is where's Aspen? They kind of knew at that point he's going to be okay. I spent a couple more days in a hospital. Then to fast forward a little bit, I was home approximately a month. I say home, I was at my parents' house. 
kind of crashing there on the couch. The recovery process, I learned then at a young age that I do not like painkillers. Now, if anybody at any given time you know, could have used some painkillers, it would have been me. You know, anybody else that ever gets them, I'm not you know, squawking about that. But I got them. I hated them. After a couple of days of being there, I, I just didn't like it. So my painkiller was ibuprofen. I mean, I had Oxycontin is what I had. This is back in the late 90s. I mean, it was, that's what we had. So I had Oxycontin. I didn't like it. Um, I didn't, didn't enjoy it. It made you feel terrible. Um, but 30 days, I mean, a month after the accident, I was back to working half days. I worked at a tire shop. I installed tires and accessories on cars and trucks. That's what I did. Um, so I was back working half days. A month and a half after the accident, I'm at the gym exercising three or four days a week while working. Now, keep in mind, I was A, so young, my brain wasn't fully developed. And you know, your brain's not developed really until age 25 is when our brain, our amygdala is full grown. We know what consequences are. There's a reason. There's a reason you can't rent a hotel room when you're 19, right? There's a reason car insurance goes down when you're in your, when you're 25. We're not really grown yet. Um, so I didn't even realize just how bad things were. You know, I kept, I just tried to bounce back and live a normal life again. But it took me a while. I couldn't do it um, because I would move quickly and the room would spin and not stop spinning. My equilibrium was jacked up for a while afterwards. In fact, my right ear still has problems. And I have equilibrium problems sometimes because of it. Um, not really a big deal. Just when it happens, it kind of stands still and goes away. But no, I tried to live normal like immediately, but it wasn't it wasn't a good idea. So I went slow, moved slowly, did things, you know, and even even tried to do things like go to a water park within like this is December, so we're talking water park time frame, May, June, July time frame. Um, went to a water park. I lived at the time in Myrtle Beach, Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. It's kind of a resort area, beach town. And uh, went to the water slides. And I'll never forget just thinking, okay, I'm feeling pretty good. I'm lifting weights. I'm you know, doing the gym deal. I'm doing the work deal. I'm living kind of normal. Things are okay. I go down the water slide and did like the whole loop de loop thing and the, the turnabouts in the water slide. And I come down and I was jacked up for the rest of the day. I, I couldn't see straight. I couldn't move. I'm like, okay, crap. <laughs> you know, too much too soon. Um, so no, I mean, it was, it was a, it was really about a year recovery, really just step by step and not wanting to even accept that I had limitations, which is something that I still look at and work to this day and teach to this day. Don't accept, don't accept this limitation. <laughs> This is unacceptable. This is not who I am. I do not have a limitation. So that's really how I got through everything. Um, as far as mentally, my gosh, man, as crazy as it sounds, at that time in my life, I don't any longer, but then I smoked. Um, so I would sit out in the back, um, in the back porch, screen porch here at my parents' house. And as silly as it sounds, I would just try to remember my life. Kind of freaky. Think about having your brain cut on. It's kind of freaky. It's like not normal stuff, man. It's kind of freaky. So I would just sit there and I'd smoke and I would just kind of think of my childhood and think of things that happened. Just think of my life, you know, try to remember and try to, you know, say, okay, I'm, I'm okay. I'm, I'm okay. <laughs> it's, if I can remember these things, I am, I am okay. So that's a short and skinny of the actual accident, what happened that evening. That is a crazy story. And, I know that um, you've had a lot of success in your life since then as well, which uh, mm -hmm. says a lot for what happened. You know, I mean, that's, that's the kind of thing that a lot of people never recover from. If they didn't, if they don't die, a lot of times they're permanently disabled or, or hindered yeah. after something like that. So again, uh, yes. blessed, right? <laughs> totally blessed. Absolutely blessed. And that actually is a good segue into what I do now, um, because you go through a, you go through something like that, and one would stop and ask, "What am I doing here? What, why am I here?" I think a lot of people 
question that at some point in their life anyways, and we kind of get all deep into it, but I was really seriously thinking, what the blank am I doing here? There's no logical reason. Science can't tell you, oh, well, because he was at this trajectory, at this angle, and you know, only with this much force. Hit. No, there is no logical scientific reason for me being here. So I was like, what? What am I doing here? Um, a couple of years later is when I became a believer. Uh, a friend of mine introduced me to the Lord, and I kind of got, got saved, and things changed from there. But I kept pondering, what am I doing here, man? I wasn't living a life worthy of me being saved from this crazy accident. And then just continue living and learning and experiencing and doing things. It wasn't long after um, that I did get full custody of my daughter. I worked with the youth uh, ministry at our church for a number of years, my wife and I did, uh, the K through five ministry, kindergarten through fifth grade. Uh, we called it the JAM ministry, J-A-M, Jesus and me. Um, it was a JAM ministry. We, we taught kids then. We taught them in Bible school and Bible studies. We did the vacation Bible schools as well. We did the trips with them. You know, I had my daughter go through the whole deal as well. I had my son. He was basically raised in the church brought people to Christ just from being out and about and doing things. Um, and then something that really changed is I lost my job in 2004. And, you know, we're looking at, you know, like five plus years after the accident, I, I lost my job. It was a family business I was working for. My dad was a contractor. I did construction work for basic manufacturing modular homes. And we did punch work and set the houses and just construction kind of stuff. And he told me, he said, the contracts aren't coming in, just we're done. I'm like, well, crap, this is what I've been doing now for years. This is how I support my family. You know, what, what am I going to do? And that's when I looked into being an entrepreneur and a friend of mine from church owned a home inspection company. I was like, I can do that. My wife goes, you can do that. Why not do that? I was supposed to get hired by him, but once I got my license and thing, he didn't want to hire me. So I was like, I need to do this, you know? So I started a business not knowing anything about business, not knowing anything about sales, marketing, and new houses and how to look at them. But I didn't know business at all. So it was really a crash course, which helped me with what I do today as well. Um, fast forward, I was doing well. I did fine with the business. I was able to double my business within 90 days after I got things in place. It worked out very well. And then 2008 happened, right? 2008 was like really crazy awesome for real estate, right? Crazy awesome year. Um, so horrible for me at that time. I went, I wanted a whole new career. I got a, I went to college. You know, at the age of that time, at the age of 32, um, so I started it, which is in 2010. I got my associates. I got my bachelor's in marketing. And by 2014, I got my MBA. I got a master's in business administration. So I earned my MBA by 2014. I mean, I, I even graduated. I mean, summa cum laude and I had the, um, MBA student of the year. So I got a fancy little award, you know, for that. Also, also speaks volumes. My brain works fine. If I can go through and do all those things in college, my brain works, my brain works fine. And as far as the, uh, I always talk about the MBA student of the year. If I take that certificate to five bucks, I'm going to buy some coffee down the road. Because it's just a fancy award I got in school. This means, hey, he knows stuff in school. Great. Now, but no, I mean, between that, and I, at this point, I've been in martial arts now for, I think, seven years. I have three different black belts. You know, I've got a second degree black belt in Taekwondo, a second degree black belt in full contact karate. I got a black belt, which is actually a kickboxing system under Bill Wallace, a master and grandmaster Bill Wallace. I got a black belt under him. I've got a blue belt in Jiu Jitsu. So that's kind of a hobby I enjoy, love martial arts. And that's something that, you know, going back to my head as well because you always you always have a head injury you know it took me a while to grasp that you, you, it's always there you don't i mean i feel it still plate in my head it still plates over here i can feel it in my head you never it's always there and there's times when i have headaches that last about three days mm. you just always have a head injury it never really goes away um kind of like my thorn in my side like you know paul had the bible God's always like, hey, you're here for a reason. You're here on purpose. I saved you for a reason. And I wouldn't trade that experience for anything now because of what I've done with it. Um, 
but a, a member I told you about riding down the slide and it freaked me out. Well, several years later, our first trip to Walt Disney World, I finally got enough nerve on our third trip there to ride a roller coaster. And it was Big Thunder Mountain. And I was like, oh my goodness, this is awesome. I grew up in Ohio, which had Cedar Point, mm -hmm. which I guess if you're in Pennsylvania, you, you I have been there, yeah. <laughs> so you know it. They were always in competition with Six Flags being the biggest, the fastest, the tallest. And so I grew up there, man. So roller coasters were like, yeah, right? Um, and not riding them is kind of like a downer. But when I went to Disney World, I was able to ride them. I was like, oh, my gosh, that's awesome. I'm okay. You know, my brain is fine. But I can, I can tell you, all the years later when I realized that physically my brain is okay. Because you, you just have to get your mind around that. Talk to a person that had heart surgery. Talk to people that came back from the war and have different limbs that are missing and things they have. It takes them a while to understand the physical part of that. Either it's okay or it's not there or whatever, right? So I had to understand, is it okay? If I fall down and bump my head, will I be okay? Well, enter my martial arts career. I went to my instructor and told him the deal. And I said, Mr. Jason, sir, I would like to train under you. My son is here to train as well. It's always been a dream. Could I, you know, you know I told the whole story about my head. He goes, what did the doctor say? And I said, well, at that time, I haven't seen a doctor in like 15 years. Last thing the doctor told me was, go live a normal life. You won't have any side effects. Good advice. I liked it. Um, so I go through, I'm doing martial arts, and I'm, you know, I'm training and doing cool things, having fun, doing all this different stuff. Well, the system that I, that I trained in, when you test for your black belt, and anybody here who's in martial arts, you know, you don't take an oral test when you get a black belt. You don't take a written test when you get a black belt. I mean, you fight, okay? I mean, it's a fight. It's not, we're not playing around, it's a fight. I mean, yes, you have headgear and pads or whatever, but I mean, when headgear or not, if I'm wearing headgear and you punch me in the head, I still feel it, okay? You're getting punched. And that makes sense in the story because I remember the guy I was fighting for my black belt, my first year black belt. I remember it clear as day. I remember the entire fight, clear as day, man. It was a left hook. I didn't have my right up well enough. And I ate a left hook, a seriously hard left hook. And you never guess where it hit. Bullseye, right on the spot, right? Right where my still plate is. Um, and I remember stepping back and I it was the first time I actually yelled like that in karate. It's kind of like an ah, you know, just and I was in pain and my instructor like stopped and his jaw dropped and Tommy, my buddy who was fighting me, he stopped, his jaw dropped. They, they knew, they all knew what I had going on there. And I did this number right here, I looked around and shook my head. I'm like, I'm good, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm good, man, it's great. Game on, right? So, um, so you they, could have they, used they, that they, to win hard. the fight, you know? <laughs> you, you, you're like, oh man, I'm hurt. And then you take him down. You know? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, third time attacking right then, right? Um, right but right. no, it freaked them out because they're like, "Is he okay?" But that's when I realized I'm okay. And I kind of came up with this saying because, and and, the, and he wants my our instructor wanted you to give a kind of a testimony about how you, how you earned your black belt and what you learned in the process. And I came up with, when God heals you, He heals you for good. He didn't, and there's that goes in many ways. Yes, I'm healed for good permanently. This this brain deal is a non-issue. I may get headaches as a reminder, but it's a non-issue. But for good, I'm here for a purpose, man. You're here for a reason. You're not. You didn't come from the slime. You didn't evolve from apes. I don't believe that nonsense for a second. You know, think about what it took for you to get here, anyways. I mean, billions of cells fighting to get a home in somebody's egg, and you're the one that made it. You're the fittest, right? You're, you're the one that's here. I was in a stupid accident that has no logical reason for me being here. I'm here for a reason. And that's when it really clicked. I was like, man, I am more than just a, you know, just a father or a husband. I'm more than just a youth minister, and I'm more than just a home inspector. I mean, I got a lot more to give than just calling dirt looking at houses man and that's when everything shifted. believe it or not was yes a head injury was always there the shift didn't happen until i realized 
I'm okay and I'm here on purpose for a reason. You know, I think everybody is here on purpose for a reason. So you then, uh, how do you apply that purpose in your life? What does your purpose look like? Absolutely. Um, and, I, and I know you're a marketer as well, where you know, a lot of people listen to this, I'd be marketers. I mean, here's, at this point, I have a, a absolute, complete and total mission and drive at this point to lead, motivate, and inspire a generation of men to lead, love, and live to their full potential so they can lead, motivate, and inspire a generation of men. That's a big grandiose. That's like, that's what juices me. Okay. And who am I working with to do that? Well, I prefer to work with male business owners because here is like, you know, the Blues Brothers, they had that whole fun saying, I'm on a mission from God. <laughs> right. I mean, that's how I believe I'm on a mission from God, man. I, my mission is this very simple to help 10,000 small business owners double their business so they can increase their reach, increase their ministry, increase God's kingdom. Think about that when you're a business owner. Think about 10 years before you have your success now. How would it feel? How would it feel like to double your business, increase it 10%, 20%? What does that mean to you as a man? I mean, I'm the man of the house. I'm not all oh, man kind of thing, but no, I'm the man of the house. I'm the provider. When you know, when my wife agreed to marry me, I agreed to take care of her. So the onus is on me as a man to provide to protect, you know, to love, honor, and cherish all those beauty things too. But I mean, all the cool stuff. I mean, I'm the breadwinner. If I'm not bringing in the dough, guess what that does to your masculinity? It almost castrates you. I mean, I mean, seriously, you just feel demasculated if you can't bring home enough money to support your family. It just deflates you. What if you, personally, you can walk up to somebody who's a business owner and help them? I know that you can. And you can say, if we just did a couple of things here, we can increase your profits. Guess what happens to him? Yes, his business grows. Great. But he grows. He grows as a person. He grows as a man. He gets more invested in his community. He's more invested in his family. He's more invested in his church. You see, growing your business when you're a business owner is about the dollars. That part's easy, man. You know what else it fixes? It fixes marriages. You know how many marriages are strained because the business is going south? That's a huge number, partner. And I know that you work with people as well, and you, you, you change lives doing the same thing. I mean, you can go in there and help your business grow. It's not just about the dollars, partner. Your life is going to be better just because you have more income and you feel more like a man and a provider, more like a person, really. Well, I've, I've seen that. There was a time... Uh, you know, I've got a, right now my business is a side gig, you know, but, um, and I have a, I have a day job, but, um, you know, there was a time when I was trying to do my business full time and dude, it, I was a mess, mm -hmm. you know, I, I was, uh, that's honestly a lot of my journey and what kind of started this whole manlyhood thing is because, he, you know, I'm, I was not sleeping right. I wasn't eating right. I wasn't there for my kids and present in their life. And I was, I, I had just made a mess of my life. My wife, mm -hmm. you know, I was growling at everybody all the time. My wife comes in and she says to me, you know, my sweet Sunday school teacher wife comes into me and <laughs> says, says, um, you know, I promised you I'd, that I'd stay with you forever, but did you have to make it so damn hard? <laughs> <laughs> and well, you know, I, it's when you know you're in trouble, you know? So I, you know, I, I get it, man. Yeah. And yeah. There's, there's definitely uh, uh, that transformation and that personal growth is, is everything, you know, to be able to grow your business, you've got to grow too. You do. I mean, it's if, if you, if you want more, you have to become more. I mean, when I teach about, cause it's, I do business coaching, marketing, coaching, consulting. I also have a mindset portion of my business as well. That's why I'm a marketing mindset coach. I mean, the mindset portion, I kind of coined the phrase, I mean, I help entrepreneurs overcome the speed bumps in their minds so they can have what they want to have. And I just use the speed bumps. It's kind of funny. I just use it. Just, you know what? God gave it to me. I'm going to use it, man. It, it also opens doors for testimony. I use it for you. But help them overcome the speed bumps in their mind. I mean, so they can 
live the lives they're called to live, not the ones they're told to live. You know, I walk them through the seven areas of their life and how to replace bad habits with good habits. You know, thinking, that's a habit, okay? Making poor decisions, that's a habit. Running your business poorly, that's a habit. You know, eating poorly, that's a habit. Anyways, I mean, that's that's part of the package deal that I work with. They want to do some marketing section, but that's that's something I get, I get juiced about, man. I totally dig it. Because, I mean, honestly, I've been there. Because that's why I mentioned the home inspection company. I've been the typical, I mean, sole proprietor, sweating bullets at night, wondering how I'm going to pay bills. I've lived it. And I know how I got out of it. And that's what I'm sharing with others. And to me, it's, it's a mission. It's a testimony. It's my ministry. But it's also my occupation. That's why it's so flipping awesome. <laughs> because it's not just something that I do for a coin. I dig it. It's, 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 it's a lot of fun. I, I enjoy seeing people change when I work with them. That juices me. And I know they're on the right path afterwards. I love it. Tell me a little bit more about uh, a uh, mindset change that has to happen. Yeah. Um, everything begins with mindset. It really does. Um, this podcast that we're on, I've seen some of your episodes. It's wicked awesome. The books that you write. You wouldn't have done any of these things if you didn't think you could do it. You wouldn't have started it somehow or some way. You wouldn't even have launched this mainly the portion of it if you didn't think you could do it. That's why mindset's so important. And other people listen to this. Maybe the dude I'm, that's hearing this right now was kind of the quintessential six feet tall, 220 pounds with 10% body fat, just burly of a strong man. He wouldn't have got that girth and that size if he didn't believe that he could achieve it. Belief, mindset, incredibly important. Um, some of the old cliches, well, the cliche because they, they ring true, man. What the mind can conceive and believe it can achieve. I mean, that may sound trite or whatever else, but stop and think about it. It's true. Mindset's incredibly important. You wouldn't even, I wouldn't have started my business if I didn't believe I could succeed somehow. I mean, and I, it really what launched me into this was when I was in college. Mind you, I was growing up in college, but um, I was, everybody else was like 10 years younger than I was, but was speaking, and I began to realize in college that I could do it. I could now speak in front of, I've spoken in front of thousands of people. Um, totally juices me, and I'm able to, you know, lead, motivate, inspire from the stage. Um, it's a mindset thing. If I didn't believe I could do it, I wouldn't even try. That's, that belief goes through the seven key areas of our life. And there's only seven. Everything in your life fits into this bracket somehow, these seven areas. I mean, the first one's mental. I mean, your mental game, spiritual. Then you have physical. Then you have financial. And then you have family. And then you have um, personal. And then you have career. Those are seven areas. That's, that's your life. Now, I don't know if you've ever been through the whole wheel of life exercise. You've seen it. And that's basically what I teach from. Okay, awesome. Let's say you're awesome in health and you're awesome in finances, but your family life is a wreck. Well, now that wheel of life is like bum, 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 bum. It's not great, man, because here's what happens. If you're awesome in some areas, those other areas you're not awesome in, they hang out right back here in your subconscious and they nag at you and they nag at you and they nag at you. Not in your forefront, not in your conscious. Unless you stop and think about that. Like if you're deep, deep in debt, back to a business owner, deep, deep in debt, struggling to pay bills. His church is wonderful. He has great friends. His health is great. His marriage is pretty good. But this whole finance thing is constantly in the back of his head. Now, it doesn't matter what area of life he's in, it affects it. It's a subconscious talking to you. That's why mindset is so important. And there's seven areas to work on. You can't just be good in one area and terrible on six. That won't work. Work on all seven, and then it happens one simple choice at a time. And it's it's a very simple process for replacing bad habits and good habits. And that's you know it all starts with mindset. If you didn't think you could do it, you wouldn't try. Awesome. I think that's some great perspective. Uh, I love the wheel of life analogy. I learned it from uh, Dave Ramsey in Entre Leadership 
is what I learned. Yeah. And I'm sure he stole it from somebody else. So it's probably been around a while. <laughs> yeah, I, I've, I've, yeah. I've borrowed it and, and, and talk about it as well. Just cause you know, and, and you can't always fix everything all at once. So mm-hmm. that wheel is spinning. So as each thing comes into focus, you give it another little tweak, you know, and yes. it goes back around. You, if you don't get it right, right away, it'll come back around again and you can work on it some more, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah I learned mine from Zig Ziglar years ago and that's, I got one of his certifications being a certified coach under him. Um, that's how I got trained to use it. But yeah, that's, that's why the program for my mindset is nine weeks, seven weeks are of each each part of that area. That's awesome. So I like to ask all my guests a couple of questions. Um, I get some really cool answers in this process, which I think has made it kind of fun. Uh, The first one is this, Shane, what does it take to be a man? What does it take to be a man? A man, I'm old fashioned. So my old fashioned definition is really there. I'm not thinking about how people are arguing about gender stuff. I don't believe in that nonsense. When you're a man, you can look down and see if you're anatomically a male or not. Um, now, what does it take to be a man? A man is a provider, a protector. I mean, a, a man is a leader, a guider, a, the leader of the house, a leader of the tribe. Look at back in the Bible times. It's not like, and I don't want to criticize anybody by any stretch, but it's not like the women went to the, the priest and got the word of God and brought it back to the house. No, the, the, the man was the one that got the word and then fed his family. And to be a man, you have to be a leader of sorts. If you're not leading, then you're not fulfilling your manlyhood obligation somewhere. It has nothing to do with your looks, how big and burly you are. I'm a whopping 175 and 5'8". I mean, I know you're definitely a bigger dude than I am. Does it make either one of us more manly? I mean, what kind of a leader, what kind of provider are you, protector? That's who we are. We're leaders, providers, protectors. That's what men do. Great answer. Good stuff. Definitely agree with you there. Um, I've definitely seen those things true many times, you know, and, and I think that that's yeah. – that's, it's it's one of those things that I I don't I'm also old fashioned and I don't mean that in a way to condemn anybody that thinks differently. I mean I can love mm-hmm. you whether you agree with me or not, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but totally. but but yeah, and there's more than being a man than just your genitalia too, you know. Like who, like who you are that I think that 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 matters. So good answer. Uh, my next question for you, Shane, is if the ten year old. Shane walked in the room and you had the chance to speak into his life, what would you tell him? (laughs) I'm going to say this, but I'm going to have to go say say something else too. If you meet a girl named Amy, don't marry her. (laughs) Brilliant. (laughs) (laughs) No, I would, I would honestly, at that age of 10, my home life was fine. My, whatever my home is fine i would tell him i would tell him to go to church sooner i really would so many other things in our life i can't really take away from because it made me who i am but i wish i would have come to the lord earlier so i would have told him to go to church my mom and dad did not my brother does not i would tell him there's a church in the back of your house you know walking distance go to church you're going to go to love and that's some good advice yeah, I uh, I grew up in church, so I've kind of been there my whole life. So so right. I had that advantage. Right. I still did a bunch of stupid stuff, but <laughs> <laughs> totally. so I, I learned I had to learn some things the hard way, but it's all good. So the next question is, what is your best advice for the men that are listening today? Um, I, I leave you with what I leave a lot, like give speeches and whatnot. Usually one of the last lines I give. It's um, very simply, it's in those times of our life, in those speed bumps in the mind, where if you just get out of your own way and let your greatness shine through, you know, then you, yes, I really do mean you, will do great things too. We get in our own way. We talk ourselves out of things. 
whatever that nudge is, that inkling to do something, whatever that is, follow that. As long as it's not ridiculous, or harmful. I mean, it's, but you're not going to have that nudge from within, that burning desire. Whatever that is, get the heck out of your way and step forward and do it. And you're going to be flipping amazed at just how great things turn out and what you actually accomplish. We have so much head trash, we just stop ourselves from doing things. Get out of your way and step into it. That is excellent advice. Excellent. It's good stuff. So let's say that the guys that are watching want to get in touch with you. They want to connect with you, learn more about what you're doing, or maybe just kind of reach out and say, hey, they want to know more. What's the best way? For them to to get in touch with you, uh, I'll, I'll keep it super simple. My website is theshaneboyd.com. Um, awesome. The Shane Boyd. That's not arrogance, by the way. That's the fact that shaneboyd.com. That is a football player. He played for Kentucky. He played for the NFL, and now he plays for the CFL. So you hear his Shane Boyd. He's a quarterback. So he already has that domain. So I just put the Shane Boyd. It's the same thing for Instagram. It's the Shane Boyd. And then you can find me at Shane Boyd on Facebook as well. But the website is just the Shane Boyd. You'll find me. Awesome. Yeah, there's a Josh Hatcher out there that's a baseball player as well. So we, <laughs> <laughs> I did get my website before he grabbed it, though. So <laughs> cool, man. No, I, I failed. He got mine. <laughs> Awesome. Well, listen, I've really appreciated you having, having you on the show and we're going to make sure to link your website in the uh, show notes. So anybody that's listening can find you from there as well. So thank you so much, Shane. I really appreciate it. It was a pleasure, Josh. Thank you. Shane, thank you so much for sharing your story with us. You know, you went through a very traumatic experience, but you came out with uh, an amazing perspective and I'm really glad that you can, make the difference in people's lives that you're making, man. Thank you for what you're doing. It's good stuff. Uh, if you guys want to connect with Shane, please check out the links in the show notes and you can check out his, his work and see if there's anything he can do to help you. Uh, even if he just, if this story that he told today meant something to you and you just want to reach out to him and let him know that, please let him know. I'd, uh, I'd appreciate it if we can, you know, support these guests that we have on the show because we've got some great guests and we want to make sure that we, we connect with them. It's good. Gentlemen, if you want to grow as a man, you want to become a better man, uh, you need to join the Manlyhood Man Cave. It's our private Facebook group for men only where we help encourage and build each other up. So go on Facebook, type in Manlyhood Man Cave, send a request to join, and there will be a couple questions you need to answer. Uh, and one of them is, am, are you a man? And if you are a man, uh, and if your Facebook account isn't a shared Facebook account with a woman, and we will let you in the group, and you can connect with us there. I'd love to have you. But guys, as always, listen, I want you to know I love you, I care about you, and I'll see you next time. If you want to be a better man, check out our website, manlyhood.com, for blogs, videos, and more from our Manlyhood team. Men, you can also join our private Facebook group, Manlyhood Man Cave, where you can meet up with a band of brothers who will challenge you and help you on your journey of manhood. This episode is produced by Hatcher Media for Manlyhood.com. Be sure to subscribe and leave us a review on iTunes, YouTube, or wherever you're listening to the show. Tune in again for more of the Manlyhood Mancast.